You're listening to Let's Talk AI. Good day. I'm Harold Godwin, Managing Director for Waterloo AI. Welcome to Let's Talk AI. I'll be your host. Today's guest is, we are honored to have Chris Elias Smith. Chris is the professor in the Department of Philosophy, also in the Department of Systems Design Engineering, and cross-appointed to the School of Computer Science here at UW. Chris is the founding director of the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. Chris also holds a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Theoretical Neuroscience. So, Chris, welcome. Thanks, Harold. It's great to be here. Awesome. This is uh, this is a real honor for us today. So, big words, neuroscience, brain modeling, artificial intelligence. How did this all start for you? If you could rewind the tape here and go back and tell us the journey. Sure. I mean, I can go back all the way to being eight year old, years old and sitting in a mall with my grandpa, actually. I remember uh, being with him and just sitting there and him making comments about what he thought different people were thinking or why, what they believed or you know, why they were doing the things that they were doing. And he kind of got me hooked on just the mysteries of human behavior. And uh, that's essentially something that stuck with me forever. It's still driving my, you know, daily life, essentially, and all my research at the University of Waterloo. And, you know, that turned, that took a while to develop. So, you know, I was uh, interested in science and things, math, loved it all through high school, and went into systems design engineering here at Waterloo, in fact, back in 89 is when I started. Um, halfway through the, my degree, I got a lot more interested in psychology than engineering, in fact, and took a lot of psychology and philosophy courses, and eventually switched into doing a master's in philosophy, also here at the University of Waterloo. And at the end of that philosophy degree, I uh, decided to keep looking at how the mind worked and took a very theoretical perspective, one that was you know, driven a lot by philosophy. So I went to Washington University in St. Louis, and they had a cool program there called philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology. It's kind of mixed all the stuff that I liked. While I was there, I started working with a physicist named Charlie Anderson, trying to build mathematical models of how the mind worked. And that really kind of brought my philosophy and engineering interests together. And uh, after I graduated from there, I stayed there for a year to do a postdoc in the McDonald Center for Higher Brain Function, uh, wrote a book with Charlie Anderson, published it, and then was lucky enough to get a job back here uh, in the philosophy department. So that's kind of the cycle. Okay. So long path, but you know, so what is breaking this down? What is neuroscience and how does it relate to, you know, fast forwarding to where we are now in the field of AI? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And in fact, you know, this term theoretical neuroscience is one that was invented while I was kind of on my trajectory that I just described. Um, Originally, neuroscience was the study of brains and neurons and how they work in biological systems to give rise to the wide variety of behavior that we see. And a lot of the studies, of course, are done in animals because we can do experiments with animals that we wouldn't do with people. Um, But of course, it, it includes all animals. So we have neurons in our brains, just like mice do. And there's a lot of similarity in how they function. So neuroscience is really the study, typically empirical experimental study of how those neurons work and you know, doing lots of experiments to try to figure that out. Theoretical neuroscience comes to that experimental study with some mathematical tools that a lot of experimentalists in neuroscience don't typically have. And so we try to quantify all of the behavior that we see in neurons. And I like to often set this up for people by comparing it to experimental and theoretical physics, because that's a little bit more familiar, right? Where you've got a bunch of physicists who do a lot of experimental work. They try to understand how materials work. They make observations about the universe and so on. And then you have theorists who try to come up with theories where you can write down the math to describe how all of those different observations fit together in some way. And so the same is true in neuroscience, a little bit to a lesser degree. It's a little bit more immature, but same kind of thing where you have a lot of experimental data. And then you have a few people doing theoretical neuroscience like I do, where we try to come up with theories and write down mathematical models and explain what are the computations and processes going on inside brains that result in all this behavior. So the connection from there to AI is probably reasonably straightforward, right? Where in AI, what you're trying to do is develop and understand mechanisms, write computer code, again, sort of give mathematical descriptions of some system that does something intelligent. And of course, starting with human 
intelligence or any kind of animal intelligence is a great place when we're trying to build machines with that same kind of intelligence. Okay, so this kind of leads us into this topic of neural networks. I guess that was a term that came out of it. So take us a little bit on that journey. And then what's the difference between neural networks and convoluted neural networks? Yeah, for sure. So neural networks is one of the ways that people do AI. Uh, definitely my preferred way. And it's the way that actually relates most closely to how brains work in neuroscience. So if you go back to the 70s, uh, there were kind of two ways that people were doing AI. One was essentially writing computer programs where they looked a lot like linguistic expressions to describe some complicated behavior like playing chess. And another way that people would do it is by taking a bunch of nodes, which were kind of like neurons, but not really, but sort of a bunch of nodes, put them in a network, connect them all up, and then get them to do interesting functions. Uh, typically not playing chess at the time, it was more things like you know recognizing images or trying to recognize words in a sentence in a stream of audio. Um, and you know, for a long time, there was kind of a battle between this symbol-like way of doing things and this neural network way of doing things. As people might know, in recent times, the neural network approach has really dominated, right? And come to be able to build the best chess playing machines in the world, the best Go playing machines in the world, the best language processors in the world. Um, and, but for a long time, people didn't really expect that necessarily to happen. Those, of course, doing neural networks wanted it to. And those who have been building brain models, like I have, immediately see the connection between the neural network approach to AI and the kinds of mechanisms that we find in biological systems, because those are also a bunch of nodes connected together that are able to perform all the functions that humans can perform. So, um, so that's kind of the connection between neural networks and neuroscience and how it's different from other ways of doing AI. And when you go to specific types of neural networks, like convolutional neural networks that you mentioned, that's really just one particular way of structuring a neural network. The reason it's interesting to bring that example up is because that type of neural network, which is really the best way we have of processing images right now uh, with machines, is based on how the structures that you see in the visual system in the brain. So when you look at the brain and you look at the kinds of computations that are being done, you'll notice that in early visual areas, it looks like you're doing the same computation over and over and over on different parts of the image. And that's exactly what convolutional neural networks do. And so seeing the brain perform that kind of computation and then turning it into a machine that does a similar type of computation was really ended up being a breakthrough in our ability to process images, right? And uh, it's still the you know state of the art for all image processing, as well as a lot of audio processing, as well as video processing and on and on. Okay, so some of the, I mean, data is the, is the gold, as they call it, that we're feeding into all these models, data, numbers, images, you know, a lot of the different perspectives that way. You talk about being able to analyze in an analytical approach. Lately, we've seen a, a, an insurgence or growth of more of the creative thing, the the dollies of the world that are doing now the artistic blends and and things like that. So what's your take on the whole analytical versus creative path that are exploding around us? I mean, you know, all of these networks that are running are analytic in some sense. You can write down equations that describe how these models are functioning. And in some ways, the question is, yeah, how do those kinds of descriptions relate to things that we typically think aren't really well described by equations like creativity? You know, interestingly, as a theoretical neuroscientist, my entire career has been trying to write down equations to describe all of the behaviors that people can do, right? Not distinguishing between creative and non-creative or motor control and visual processing or high-level reasoning and you know, low-level reaction. Uh, all of those seem like the same brain is you know, performing them. That brain is governed by the laws of physics. The laws of physics, we often can write down equations to describe systems that are governed by those, and that's literally what we're doing in the case of the brain. So in some ways, I think it's not a difference in kind. It's really just a difference of perspective and maybe a difference of scale that makes us think that one of these things is explainable and analytic and the other is unexplainable and creative. Um, so yeah, ultimately, you can understand a lot of what looks like creativity is a kind of sampling, random sampling from distributions of you know, possible future states. Uh, and that's essentially what's going on when these networks like DALI and even the large language models are generating their responses to questions or trying to you know, satisfy the request from a user to construct a robot riding on a bunny rabbit in the moon or whatever you know, random thing we happen to say to them. Uh, so in some ways, 
I still think of all of this as being sort of understandable and describable by equations. It's just how surprising it is or isn't seems to be what drives people's interest and excitement and concern sometimes about exactly where these systems are headed. So there's a lot of demand for AI literacy. Companies trying to put their head around, what is this? How do I do it? They want results tomorrow. They don't want to, you know, go through five years of research to get there. I would say your area definitely would be more under foundational AI as opposed to applied. And I hope I'm not overstepping the bounds and categorizing this. How does your work affect you know, the everyday life of the rest of us at this point. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Or, or, or companies. Yeah, and actually, really. I'll, I'll challenge you a little bit on your assumption that what I do is foundational AI. Um, definitely, we do that. But, you know, we have a really beautiful example in my estimation, which is kind of like convolutional neural networks in the sense that uh, recently we were looking at how brains process information over time. Um, and this is something, you know, it's a mystery. It's something that you know, we don't have, you know, perfect understanding of by any uh, means. Uh, we built lots of neural networks to try to process information over time. But, you know, when we looked at the hippocampus and we sort of saw what was going on in the brain there, uh, we managed to write down a really nice equation that described as fairly simple neural network that we could show was actually optimal at doing representation of temporal data. So anything that's kind of changing over time. Um, and so, we, you know, we found that structure in the hippocampus, we showed that it could predict the spiking activity that you find in rodents when they're doing particular kinds of tasks and so on. Uh, and then we said, hey, you know, this is a simple neural network. Why don't we start running it on all the state-of-the-art benchmarks that everyone is you know, doing in AI right now? And when we started doing that, we started beating them all. Um, so this is a really nice example and fairly rare where you can say somebody was doing work understanding how the brain worked. They wrote down some equations to say what the brain was doing, and then they came up with a new kind of neural network that's doing better on all the benchmarks and therefore is actually very applied, right? And right now, that same algorithm is actually uh, you know, being taken by a company, a spin-out company from Waterloo, and uh, they're building a chip to run that. And you know, right now, they're expecting that they will be able to build chips that can run with such efficiency that they can do uh, basically functions that are currently only doable on the cloud. So, you know, you can imagine like a little uh, earbud piece that you put in your ear and then it will translate in real time a foreign language into your ear, something that you just can't do with hardware right now. So this combination of a particular algorithm with some uh, hardware, where the hardware itself actually is not that complicated, it really comes down to this algorithm that we discovered by looking at the brain, is going to let us build devices that are smarter, lower power, you know, which is, of course, great for the planet because it will reduce the amount of carbon footprint to still do all the AI we want. Uh, yeah, there's really a straight line from some work that was going on in the lab looking at brains right to you know, really interesting and uh, sort of critical real-world practical applications. Well, that's great. You're closing that gap between foundational and exactly. applied. Ultimately, you know, my lab really has two desired outcomes from the research that we're doing. One is like the one that I just described where, you know, go from the brain and build a cool device. The other is when you build models of the brain and understand how they work, of course, there's lots of biological outcomes. Like, you know, does that let us understand different kinds of diseases better? Can we take our brain models, you know, and try a drug on it? Essentially, you know, a hypothetical drug on a hypothetical brain where we're not damaging any people or animals or anything. Um, and really, both of these streams, I think, are fairly natural extensions of the work that goes on. So some is AI, and but other is looking at better understanding the medical properties of brain. Wow, that's uh, that's a fascinating <laughs> fork in the road, if you want to call it that. So I'm going to go back to an area that, you know, we did a quite a popular event with you about a year and a half, two years ago on spiking neural networks. And... If you could just give us, again, a synopsis, what is that all about? And and is that passe or where are we at with that kind of thing today? Because I did have a company reach out to me probably six months ago looking for that. And I think it was probably aligned with what you've talked about. They just wanted to do things fast. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting, interesting arc and story behind spiking neural networks. So, yeah, let's uh, so backing up a little bit, you know, we were comparing brains to artificial neural networks. One of the big ways that they're different is that most of the information in a biological brain, especially at the level of our brain, uh, is transmitted using very short action potentials or voltage changes, which are often called spikes. So they're very, very brief. They're less than a millisecond long. And then there's many milliseconds in between them, like hundreds or thousands, before you see another one. Um, and so that information is transmitted in this really bursty manner throughout our brains. 
in artificial neural networks, that's definitely not the case, where typically what you do is at every moment in time, you send a like 32-bit number. Uh, and so you have a lot of information constantly flowing through all of these networks. Uh, whereas in the spiking neural network, you kind of have a one or a zero that just shows up every once in a while. So when you see that difference, you can wonder, like, you know, what are the practical implications of that? One of the most obvious ones seems to be that brains use way, way less energy than our standard computers, like our GPUs that we run all our neural networks on. Um, so just as a you know specific number, it, people estimate that the human brain uses about 20 watts to be running. These computer programs, like you know, large language models, um, which are not nearly at the scale of a human brain, are running for tens of thousands of watts, right? So they're they're huge amounts of power that they draw when you're doing inference on these things. Um, so I mean, that might be a little bit unfair. So they use the most power when they're being trained, uh, but even when they're doing inference, so that's when they're just kind of like running online to to answer a question. They're still using hundreds of watts, right? And so they also can't do what people can do. <laughs> so they're not as functional, but they're using you know, 10 to 100x to 1,000x more power. So the question is, is that partly because of this spiking and non-spiking difference? And a lot of uh, researchers and several companies have actually started exploring that in hardware. So they build chips, uh, which are spiking chips. They send information in this event-based manner instead of these continuous stream of you know, 32-bit digits. Uh, and so you know, a lot of the algorithms that we have developed can be used to program those kinds of chips. And so we've actually uh, worked with companies like Intel and IBM um, and smaller companies like SpinCloud, where they all have a, you know, a variety of different ways of implementing these spiking neural networks. Um, and they do tend out typically to be more power efficient than non-spiking neural networks. Uh, and you can typically get them to work just as well. So you, know, you get the same accuracy, but then you see a big reduction in power. Um, so, that being said, you know this is still an active area of research. There are you know a number of startups that have uh, built chips. Very few of them are commercially available. Uh, they're also typically on very small scales, right? Unlike massive LLMs and you know these huge GPU farms that people are using to do a lot of AI. And so figuring out exactly where they are commercially interesting has been tricky. And for this reason, Intel has never released their neuromorphic chip, and they're still developing it. So yeah, so you know spiking neural networks is in this interesting category where it seems clear that there is some benefit to be had by mimicking this property of brains that is transmitting and computing with spikes. But it's not sort of commercially mature enough to actually have made a really big impact in the world yet. But maybe as we become more and more sensitive to energy use for our AI models, it will become more and more important for people to be developing these kinds of models. Uh, the last thing I will mention about spiking neural networks is they are also better at typically real-time processing. So you said that a company came to you because they were interested in things to go faster. Uh, and again, often if you're trying to process streaming data, so you're like constantly getting the data all the time and you want to react as quickly as possible and you don't want to send tons of information around all the time, or you can't because you have bottlenecks of various sorts, then again, it seems like spiking neural networks are often at a bit of an advantage. They can react quicker than you would otherwise be able to react to real-time data uh, using computers of the standard variety that you tend to find nowadays. So yeah, there are a couple of different um, sort of features of spiking neural networks, which people are continuing to explore. And uh, I still am really interested in them. Uh, you know, We use this kind of neuromorphic hardware, it's often called the spiking hardware, in some of our research. And yeah, we build robots that run with neuromorphic hardware and so on and so forth. Um, but it's not quite at the stage that things like convolutional neural networks are as far as everyday impact. Earlier, you talked about that um, leap from foundational to applied. Is that more in the convolution, uh, convolutional neural network approach? You said that it was a rapid uh, reduction in processing and more efficient. So convolutional net neural networks have definitely made that leap. So, uh, and our, this uh, other algorithm I talked about for processing temporal information, so that's called the Legendre memory unit or LMU. Uh, so that LMU thing is in the process of making that leap, I would say. Um, it actually is uh, sort of commercially deployed now, so people are using it you know, in commercial, but it's not nowhere near as uh, sort of mature as something like convolutional neural networks. Um, but both of those are ahead of where spiking neural networks are right now. Okay. So you've given us an insight from the past. Up to speed where we are now, what's ahead? Give us a little bit of a 
uh, you know, look ahead from your, your eyes, your perspective, where do you see things going? Yes. Prediction is always hard, especially about the future. I am very uncertain. I will say I, I'm, I'm not as, uh, I guess, concerned for our existence as many in the, uh, current popular, uh, blogosphere and so on seem to be, um, I don't think that the models that we are using now are going to take over the world or spell the end of humankind. Nevertheless, you know, they are extremely impressive and uh, it's, they are going to continue growing in power and impressiveness as engineers and others keep building them bigger and bigger. And as we continue to scale up the amount of compute that we have available for AI. Um, so, uh, in some ways, that that's kind of the boring prediction. Is like it's more of the same, and we're going to see, you know, uh, continued improvements, et cetera. I think the kind of thing that will uh, maybe be more surprising is when these things start showing up in robots and it's sort of in the home, and in ways where uh, right now we just you know aren't used to interacting uh, in a daily basis with any other kind of even vaguely intelligent. Uh, creature in our physical environment. So people have Roombas and things, um, but you know they're not really that intelligent. Uh, but you know it it doesn't seem unlikely that there are going to be lots of techniques uh, where people are going to figure out how to take what we typically see online, you know, these large language models and so on, and start getting that kind of behavior. In there's many different strategies you could use to do this, but to get that into robots and things that are in our physical environment, um, and I think that will cause a lot of similar kind of hand-wringing potentially uh, that we've seen as these models have seemed to get intelligent in ways that have also surprised us in the language domain. Um, so I think that's, yeah, you know, interesting, something to look for. It definitely has significant uh, potential implications for things like jobs, um, same way that the large language models do. And uh, I'm not sure if many people are thinking about that right now, but it's something that I'm guessing in my lifetime will, will show up in sort of the same way that this large language model stuff has. Um, I don't think there's any particular limitation on how uh, intelligent these systems can get. Um, it's not clear to me what's going to be hard and what's going to be easy. Uh, th those are the kinds of things that, you know, if you could predict, you'd be really rich because you'd know ex <laughs> exactly where to spend your money, what companies to bet on, and so on. Um, but also, they're absolutely the most difficult things to try to figure out um, for all kinds of reasons. So yeah, I don't I don't know if that's much of a uh, satisfactory kind of answer, but no, that's fine. You know, and if I come back to just your research, is there is there something in the near term that you're you know focused on to get that breakthrough? Um, yeah, so actually, yeah, that's a, a fairly different question. So you know, when the we're looking at work in my lab, we're typically trying to understand cognition as a biological process, right? So we're not really trying to build a company or a big large language model. Those things aren't irrelevant because, um, yeah, you know, they're, they're doing some of the same functions that we're interested in. But, you know, we've been developing techniques which are more on the foundational AI side, uh, as you were sort of hinting at before. You know, so we've been developing new methods for taking kind of any statistical problem and putting it into a neural network in a very systematic way. Um, seeing how that maps on to the kinds of neural activity that you find in the brains of many different animals as well as people. So really kind of going back to sort of first principles and seeing, can we put together integrated, complicated models of biological systems that do the things that biological systems do well that still our AI doesn't do well, right? And that, you know, people, of course, are much better at solving novel problems than an AI, right? We can put people into an environment where they haven't been trained for millions and millions and millions of samples, uh, and people can handle that, right? So they can kind of learn on the fly, right? Most of these language models, they're fixed, and then you interact with them. And if their data gets out of date, then they just tell you things that are two years old. But of course, people are constantly updating their information. They're constantly adapting to their environment. They're learning new skills. Um, you know, they have a level of robustness and ability to solve problems that are just way, way beyond what we can still do with AI. Uh, and so those are, that's kind of the realm of sort of biological skill that my lab is really focused in and interested in. Um, whether or not we'll come up with some big breakthrough that you know, lets us understand that to a point where it can then be put into machines, I don't know. Um, whether, yeah, you know, 
exactly what the path for doing that would look like. I think you want to be careful. There's definitely ethical concerns and considerations when you start trying to build something and releasing it into the world and letting it solve arbitrary problems and learning whatever it wants and all this kind of stuff. Obviously, you want to be a bit, a bit careful about doing that kind of thing. But yeah, really, we're at the point of trying to get all of the sort of foundational theory down, understand how you can build big, complicated, integrated systems, how you can amalgamate the information we have about how brains work with our theoretical understanding of neural networks and statistics and high dimensional vector spaces. Um, and yeah, there's just kind of so, so much going on that it's, I would say, very difficult to predict exactly what's going to be coming out of that. But lots of interesting and cool things have come out in the last 20 years. So it'll probably be something interesting and cool. That's maybe the extent of my prediction. <laughs> Well, that's great. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful insight into neuroscience, AI, and you know where you're doing it with your lab and brain brain work there. So thanks again today for participating here on Let's Talk AI. Thanks, Harold. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs>